might remember from uh, secondary school that uh, Newton told us that weight is proportional to mass. And I think everybody remembers that Einstein told us that energy is related to mass. Unfortunately, neither of the, these guys explained where the masses come from in the first place. And that's where our friend Peter Hicks comes in, and uh, there's his formula written on the blackboard behind him. And uh, I actually have his formula written on my t-shirt here. I hope you can read it. I'm not expecting you necessarily to understand it, but at least there you are. His theory can be written down in a formula on a t-shirt. Now, it's a key aspect of his theory that there should be an additional particle beyond the ones that we had on the previous slide. And that's what we call the Higgs boson. So I just want briefly to try to explain how his theory works, not in any mathematical technical detail, but just to give you some idea of what the idea is. So you should imagine that the space is filled with some sort of universal medium, much like Siberia in the middle of winter, where there's a thick layer of snow everywhere. Now, what happens when you try to cross that snow field? Well, if you're lucky, you've got skis, you skim across the top of the snow, you go very fast, and that's like a particle without mass that does not interact with the Higgs field that fills the universe. An example of such a particle without mass is the particle of light, what we call the photon. Okay, so no mass, no interaction with Mr. Higgs, you travel at the speed of light. But maybe you have snowshoes. In that case, you sink into the Higgs snow field, you interact with Mr. Higgs, you go slower than the skier, and that's like a particle with mass, like the electron that always travels at less than the speed of light. And then, of course, if you're really unlucky, you might be stuck in Siberia with only your boots. In that case, you're going to sink very deeply into the snow, you're going to go very slowly, like a particle with big mass. Okay, so that's the basic idea. A universal Higgs medium and the strength of your interaction with that medium tells you how much your particles weigh. Of course, the next question is, what is that snow actually made of? And of course, we know what regular snow is made of. It's made of snowflakes. And according to Mr. Higgs's theory, the fundamental constituent of that universal field is the particle that we call the Higgs boson. That's the analog of the snowflake. So this is the theory that Peter Higgs proposed in 1964. And I personally got interested in, in 1975. And I tried with my two colleagues to think about what a Higgs boson might look like in experiments. And at the time, all these ideas were regarded as being very speculative. And at the end of our paper, you know, we were a little bit cautious. We say we don't want to encourage big experimental searches for the Higgs boson. Fortunately, our advice was not taken. And Something like 30 years later, the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, came into operation at CERN, designed precisely to look for the Higgs boson and to answer some of Gauguin's other questions. So here's the tunnel of the Large Hadron Collider. It's about 100 meters underground. The circumference of the tunnel is 27 kilometers and billions of particles go around, and they make maybe billions of collisions every second. And with those collisions, we hope to recreate what happened, the nature of dark matter, maybe where the matter in the universe came from, and other Gauguin questions. So it's one thing to bang protons together. Then you have to look what comes out. For that, you need very big, complicated detectors. And these are pictures of the detectors uh, during the time of their installation. And you can see how big they are. If you look at the upper uh, right-hand picture, you will see a person, not a Lego person, a real full-size person. 
So these detectors were put together by scientists from around the world, literally thousands of them from dozens of countries. So the discovery of the Higgs boson that I mentioned in a moment was made at CERN, but not by CERN, it was made by these thousands of physicists. Just a little comment. It, it, in order to enable all these physicists to work together and share their data, Tim Berners-Lee, whom you see here, invented the World Wide Web at CERN a little over 30 years ago. I don't think he or anybody else maybe understood the revolution that it would make in our world, in our way of life throughout the world. And I think that we all owe a very big debt of gratitude today to Tim Berners-Lee for inventing the World Wide Web. Where would we be without it? In the time of COVID, we rely on the World Wide Web for communications, like this video conference. Uh, we rely on it for commerce, for ordering our groceries online, and for entertainment. Netflix, Spotify, Instagram, etc., etc. So, CERN, through Tim Berners Lee, through the World Wide Web, I think plays a big role in our everyday life. But let's get back to Peter Higgs and 2012 when his particle, the Higgs boson, was discovered. So, this created a lot of excitement in the particle physics community, which I characterize as mass hysteria. So what was this triggered by? Well, it was triggered by two of the big LHC experiments, ATLAS and CMS, discovering events, collisions, which had the characteristics expected for a Higgs boson. And here's one example from the ATLAS experiment. So this is a computer image of the detector. You see yellow lines, those are charged particles. You see blobs where neutral particles came out without leaving tracks. And you see four straight red lines. Those correspond to four particles that might have come from the decay of a Higgs boson. This is another example observed by the CMS experiment. Again, you see this curved orange charged particle tracks. And you see two straight red lines corresponding to lots of energy being deposited by a pair of neutral particles, probably photons, the particles of light. And that was something that we had calculated back in 1975 with my colleagues. So Atlas and CMS announced that they had seen these interesting events, they had discovered a new particle, and particle physicists got very happy. So here you see the scene in the CERN auditorium, uh, everybody is cheerful. And uh, this is a picture that I particularly like, because on the right you see Peter Higgs, and in the middle you see a colleague of his, Francois Anglais, who proposed a theory to Peter Higgs. And although they proposed their theory 48 years before the discovery of the Higgs boson. They'd never met. This is the instant when they met. And uh, it's no secret that Peter Higgs had tears in his eyes when this particle was finally discovered. So anyway, that's one reason why I like this picture. The other reason is because uh, here, circled in red, you see Fabiola Gianotti, who was one of the physicists who announced the discovery that day, and is now CERN's director general. So uh, we, at least at CERN, we don't have any glass ceiling. So the discovery of the boson was a big deal. Uh, without it, there would be no atoms, because electrons would fly away from nuclei at the speed of light. There'd be no heavy nuclei. Weak interactions responsible for radioactivity would not be weak. Uh, not only would we glow in the dark, life would be impossible. Everything would be radioactive. So the discovery of the Higgs boson was a big deal. We owe a lot to Peter Higgs. So what else are we looking for now? 
So to just give you a flavor of this, I want to uh, borrow from James Bond with one or two small modifications, also paraphrasing the title of the movie. Instead of the world is not enough, I say that the standard model of particles is not enough. Why? To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.